Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Ressler. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at McLean. And on behalf of Scott Rausch, our President, and Carol Vallone, our Board of Trustees Chair, um, and Shelley Greenfield, our um, Chief Academic Officer, welcome to the third um, McLean Sponsored Technology and Psychiatry Summit. Um, Scott will be here for parts of it, wasn't able to make the entrance, so I got to do his, his due diligence with the opening remarks. I wanted to remind us or be sad that last year he said he opened us by wearing his Red Sox hat uh, cap, which we um, unfortunately this year aren't there, but um, go Nats, I guess I can say. <laughs> um, McLean's Hospital's Institute for Technology and Psychiatry, ITP, brings together thought leaders in healthcare, data science, technology, industry, patient advocacy, academic research, and more for this two-day summit. We really aim to be a place where we can bring together academic thought leaders, clinicians, and industry advocates to really try to figure out how do we move forward. We're really at a transformative time in the field of mental health and psychiatry. On the positives, um, there's been a great move towards reducing stigma. We've had great increased awareness of mental health issues and what is needed. And there, of course, over the last couple decades, been amazing transformative discoveries in neuroscience. At the same time, we have technologies now that can aid in screening and diagnosis and stratification and digital phenotyping with interventions from internet-based CBTs to direct-to-consumer, app-based approaches, cognitive bias approaches, using phones, wearable devices, and as well as with tools like computational neuroscience and artificial intelligence and machine learning. But nonetheless, approximately one-fifth of our population, 20% of adults, will suffer with mental illness and mental health problems during their lifetime. And we've, we've um, really not moved the needle yet on suicide our biggest mortality in this field. And suicide rates amongst, are the highest amongst youth and elderly. And that brings us to this year's theme. The 2019 summit will focus on understanding how the application of technology varies among children, adolescents, young adults, and older adults. We'll further explore how technology can enhance care in major neuropsychiatric disorders as well as autism and dementia. How do we really approach these problems with the future of mental health across the lifespan. This is our third um, Technology and Psychiatry Summit. We began um, hosted by Justin Baker, um, one of the directors of the Institute for Technology and Psychiatry in 2017. And the 2017 summit was the first of its kind bringing together the nation's top technology and mental health experts to build on the promise of technology in diagnosis and delivery of mental health care. Among those who presented were Tom Enzel, former NIH director, um, Ken Duckworth of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, Roz Picard um, of MIT, and Sarah Lenslock of the AARP. Last year, in 2018, we focused on translation, closing the gaps in translational um, problems in psychiatry and mental health, where we focused on using technology and pervasive sensing approaches to advance the detailed cross-species study of behavior in order to bridge the human and non-human translational gap. We had, were led by Bruce Cuthbert of NIH and, and the director of the RDoC Initiative, Michelle Williams, the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, and Sandy Pentland from MIT. This year, as Ipsit will tell us and just remind us in just a minute as he walks through the program, we will both have an enormous array of really amazing thought leaders in the field. Um, and we'll also be using a number of new technologies ourselves. And so um, Ipsit will tell you more, but so that you hear it as a broken record, um, make sure you download your app early and often and be ready to put in your questions as we'll be it using those throughout. Um, the team, I'll introduce Ipsit in just a minute, but again, just wanted to thank the program committee and the, first of all, the directors of the Institute for Technology um, and Psychiatry, Ipsit Vahia, who I'll introduce, Justin Baker, Laura Germain, Mona Potter, and Bill Carlazan. And the program committee, um, additionally, Courtney Elias, Elisa Bush, um, Kristen Javaris, um, and Nate Van Kirk. And most importantly, um, the lovely people who are um, leading us and helping us along the way. Um, with uh, You'll see, we'll thank them in full at the end, but um, Rachel, Praise, Luke, Anika, Miranda, Rose, um, and the development team. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to um, introduce um, Ipsit Vahia, who has taken on with his team the lead of organizing this year and putting this great program together. Um, Ipsit is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the director of research um, in geriatrics um, at McLean Hospital. Thanks so much, Ipsit, for putting this great program together. Thank you.
Thank you, Kerry, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I will say that I've actually been dreaming of this moment for uh, quite a while, and uh, in my dream, I talk, and there's like three people in the audience. It's kind of terrifying. So uh, all, all of which is to say thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so you know, this is preaching to the choir, but uh, Digital mental health is growing fast. Uh, one way of sort of seeing how fast it has grown is I, I, did, I did something very simple. I searched PubMed without any parameters for just digital mental health. And you can see that from even in just the last decade, uh, the number of papers as, as one reflection of how this field has exploded shows how around 2014, things just began to take off. Uh, and this coincides with uh, the work of the Institute for Technology and Psychiatry at McLean, where uh, it started off as a little interest group of some people that were using an app here or there in research or a wearable. Uh, those people kept talking. Justin was uh, part of the lead. It was designated formally as the Institute for Technology and Psychiatry in uh, early 2016. Uh, things progressed from there, and, and we decided that uh, there needed to be some cohesion among us, uh, but many of us had friends on the outside. So we got together, as Kerry said, in 20, uh, late 2017 for the first tips. Uh, it was a grand experiment. It went reasonably well, so we decided we would do another. Um, and that went reasonably well also, so we said, let's do a third. Uh, and so here we are today. To recap the themes, though, I think the themes sort of reflect how the field of digital psychiatry has matured. Uh, the first one was broad. It was themed building a more accessible future with sort of this idea that uh, there was a lot of possibility within the field um, and with technology of really changing things. I think as it matured, we got more sophisticated in how we were thinking about technologies and specific ways in which they could impact psychiatric care. That led to a, a theme focused more on closing the gaps in translating uh, research uh, both from bench to bedside and then from bedside into, uh, into more broader practice. And this year, I think the focus has shifted a little bit from uh, just technology as a research tool to technology as something that we integrate into patient care. So now we're talking about the future of mental health across the lifespan, and that's this year's theme. We intend to approach this theme um, in a number of very broad ways. Uh, and look at it through several different lenses. One of the best things about this gathering is it brings together people that might not otherwise talk regularly every day. There's clinicians here, there's clinical researchers, there's basic science researchers, there's data scientists, there's engineers, there's entrepreneurs, uh, people from all walks of industry. Our three keynote speakers reflect that diversity. We will be hearing from Wendy Nielsen from the National Science Foundation. Uh, we will be hearing from Molly Coy, who uh, is the executive in residence at Avia uh, and based out of Silicon Valley. And then tomorrow we will be hearing from Saul Levine, the CEO of the American Psychiatric Association. So we will hear from uh, three perspectives, that of uh, the federal government and, and the science perspective, uh, the view from the side of industry, and then Saul representing professional advocacy and the largest uh, gathering of clinicians in America today. Also keeping with the theme, the reason we picked lifespan was it represents uh, a maturing in how we're coming up with clinical indications and clinical applications for this technology. There are two spotlight panels later today. Um, the first one, which happens right after I'm done, will focus on aging. And then our last panel of the day will focus on childhood and adolescence. Uh, if you look at the structure of the panels, you will see that both these uh, panels, for one, they're all-star panels. I, we think of them as like the Avengers of technology and digital health. Uh, I won't go through each of the speakers right now, but their bios are all on the app, which is to say, please download the app. And uh, many diverse viewpoints here. And in some ways, uh, the richest thing about these panels is how they look at the same problem through multiple lenses. It's the old analogy of you can look at parts of the elephant, but you really need to look at the elephant as a whole to understand what it's about. Let's step back to the clinical piece, though. Right? Any clinicians in the audience here or people that see patients? Several. Wonderful. 
So what is the patient care ecosystem? Um, it, it, it starts with a physician or a provider and a patient in sort of that provider uh, client dyad, where the patient presents, there's usually a clinical assessment. Um, as part of the clinical assessment, we will typically gather collateral information, look at a record, call up a family member, check out labs, imaging, whatever. Based on all of this, we will formulate what's happening, and based on the formulation, there is a treatment plan. Now, the treatment plan could include medications, it could include psychotherapy, uh, usually some case management, and then, um, especially in the American healthcare system, a degree of care coordination. All of these things collectively will shape the outcome. We monitor the outcome, and then we plan follow-up, and follow-up planning is often part of the treatment plan itself, and then we rinse and repeat. This is, this is the ecosystem of the care of an individual patient. Now, when you have several of these, you can aggregate it and um, you can look at it in the context of different clinical settings, be it inpatient or outpatient or out in the community or in primary care. If you aggregate that, then you end up looking at it from uh, the point of view of systems of care. And there's questions then around the cost of healthcare, there's questions around access of healthcare. All of this is grounded in one very specific facet, uh, data. Everything runs on data. And the truth is that the data we work with are, there's room for improvement. Again, I'm speaking, preaching to the choir here, but we need more unbiased, reliable, valid collateral information. Uh, we need better informed clinical assessment and that's reflective of real-world clinical status, not just the 15 to 45 minutes you spend with the patient. More personalized care, uh, more informed decision-making. Um, we need better data around medications and, and how they are being used. We need better data around engagement and response to psychotherapy. We need better data about case management and how it impacts uh, outcomes. Many of you may know that case management is actually not covered under Medicare, even though older adults with uh, cognitive impairment are um, some of the heaviest resource users. We need data on how to better integrate all of these pieces of psychotherapy. Um, and we need better ecological information. We rely on a lot of subjective self-report to determine how someone is doing. So these are complex, complex questions. Um, the good news is that some of the, the most potent forces in the land are now focusing on this, uh, specifically the National Institutes of Health. And uh, we have a panel later this afternoon that looks at intensive longitudinal assessment of health and behavior that's based on um, a large National Institute of Health program that uh, spans multiple, uh, multiple institutes and brings together a diverse group of investigators. Stay tuned for that one. In many ways, digital health, uh, it started out, and tips one reflects this, it was, it was like uh, toddlerhood or early childhood, where there was a lot of possibility, a lot of excitement, um, a lot of what might happen, and we were enjoying ourselves because it was really cool. Since then, the field has matured, and, and, and the way a child grows, I think we're closer to the adolescence phase now, where. Uh, Everyone here would agree that there are things that we would like to do that we can't because it's actually not in our control at all. And there's uh, unpredictable things and there's, there's roadblocks that we just can't get past. Anyone that's raised an adolescent will identify with this. A big one in our field is privacy. We need to, we need to figure this out. And as, as with raising an adolescent, if you get it wrong, it could impair the whole field. If you get it right, it can uh, lay the pathway for uh, the field to thrive. Uh, this is just a snapshot of papers published around the topic of privacy in the last six months alone. Uh, so to acknowledge that ethics and privacy and data security are going to be the things that make or break this field, we have a panel tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock uh, focused on what makes clinical research and clinical work in digital psychiatry ethical. It's going to be an interactive panel with a lot of audience participation. Uh, Please make sure you get in early for that. As Kerry mentioned, there's a few new things at TIPS this year. We are live streaming worldwide, which uh, um, part of the feedback we've gotten for two years is if you're a tech conference, that's the least you can do. So we, uh, so we listened. 
We also have a conference app, which is, again, another first, same rationale. You need, you need an app or, um, and live stream to matter these days. Uh, but the other thing was we opened up the program for tips this year to submissions from um, around the world. Uh, we received 75 different applications, um, enough that instead of having uh, panels just in this room, we have breakout panels this year. Uh, one set of breakout panels will be in this room. The second one will be in the break conference room, which is, uh, you will see directions. You walk across the stairs, past the cafeteria, and through the double doors. Uh, the first panel is on data-driven approaches to care, and the second one is titled, How Can the Digital Footprint Impact Research and Care in Psychiatry? Because we had so many excellent applications, we actually did a second set of breakout panels. These will happen tomorrow, later in the evening. The first one is called, Can uh, Digital Approaches Reduce Negative Clinical Outcomes in Psychiatry? And the parallel panel was called, Towards Better Healthcare and Better Access to Healthcare. Uh, you will see there are double speakers. Those are both talks that are going to be uh, uh, co-presented by, uh, in the first case, the developers of an innovative telemedicine program, and in the second case, it includes the perspective of a stakeholder that had input in developing the app. So it's a nice example of patient-centered design. Uh, we also have a poster session this evening that will be on the mezzanine um, upstairs. Uh, it's accompanied by a beer and wine reception, so stay hungry and thirsty. Um, our posters are divided broadly into seven themes. And these themes, I think, do a nice job of capturing uh, the breadth of the field. We talk about digital psychiatry, but the term in and of itself has quickly become meaningless because um, someone that's working on, say, CPT codes for digital mental health and someone that's working on artificial intelligence probably don't speak the same language, yet they fall under the same banner. So there's something nice about that, also something a little inconvenient because uh, the term does not capture the, the breadth of the field. Uh, so be sure to check the posters out. Uh, our priority, and in my role as medical director of the Institute for Technology and Psychiatry, has really shifted over these few years into focusing on how we can take all of this and actually use it to make uh, a difference to a patient on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to introduce the Digital Psychiatry Innovations Initiative. That's what we're calling it right now. It's, it's, it's really hard to come up with a good acronym for something that says technology and clinical care and uh, patient outcomes. Uh, but it's aimed towards putting both digital phenotyping and digital therapeutics into practice and into the clinics uh, we are focusing actually on uh, developing clinical use cases, so a series of N of 1 studies. Um, it will be based on academic industry partnerships. Um, on the back end, standardizing the process of security clearance and vetting technologies, and generating evidence to support the use of some of these tools. Um, and the initial focus is going to be on mood and cognitive disorders in late life and in anxiety in children and adolescents. VR has emerged as an early focus, and uh, uh, among other things, it makes for really engaged uh, research assistance. Finally, um, anyone recognize this picture? Any, anyone into cricket? I, I thought not, but I had to do it. Well, a couple of people. This is Clive Lloyd. Uh, he was the captain of the West Indian cricket team uh, from 1974 to, uh, well, 1985, pardon the typo. Um, but this is, this is important because that team is considered the most dominant and successful in, in the history of cricket. So another advantage of tips is you learn history about a sport that you had uh, no interest in. <laughs> but um, why, why am I talking about this? Uh, because Clive Lloyd is widely considered the greatest cricket team captain in history. And he was asked not long ago about what his secret was and that it's never been replicated. And he, um, I won't name more names, but he named each of the players in his cricket team saying that I had Haynes and Greenwich and Dujan and Marshall and to, with, with a team like that, to be the most successful captain of all time, all I really needed to do was not get in their way. I feel the same way about organizing this meeting. I had the privilege of working with uh, 
the best team in the business. Um, I really just had to stay out of their way. So I will go through the names. The Technology and Aging Lab, who are also the primary organizers, Prezo Oyemi, Anika Rehman, Miranda Skurla, and Rose May. Um, our Office of Development, who worked tirelessly to make uh, all of what we're having here possible, Elizabeth Few, Sudi Marco, and Shivangi Shah. Rachel Sava, who's been here for two months, but it feels like I've known her forever. She's the new program director of the ITP, and our Office of Public Affairs and Communications. Also, our incredible program committee, who helped uh, put everything together and uh, came up with ideas that I would never have come up with on my own. Um, Nora, Justin, Mona, Bill Carlison, Courtney, Elisa, Nathaniel, Kristen, and uh, Kerry himself. And finally, the leadership of the uh, Institute of Technology and Psychiatry for recognizing the value of bringing a group like this together once a year, uh, because we see this as uh, nothing short of a place to uh, shape the future of the field. Finally, our sponsors, um, whose support has, uh, again, made it possible for us to be here. Now, I said that TIPS is a grand experiment. Uh, one big difference is that the first time we did one, we said, let's do one and see what happens, and it went well, so we did another, and that was okay, so we did a third. This is the first time that I can share and announce that we will be doing a fourth. It will be here about a year from um, Saturday. Save the date. Thank you. And now just to get straight into it, uh, we'll start with our opening uh, panel focused on aging. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel moderator and it is my uh, great honor to welcome Gary Gottlieb. Um, Gary is known to many of us in the audience. Uh, he is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and uh, former CEO and president of Partners in Health and the former president and CEO of Partners Healthcare. Gary. Before I, before I hand the mic over to Gary, I will say that someone will be sitting here for the speakers with this sign. Uh, at two minutes, you will see this, and then when your time is up, you will see this. It will be uh, embarrassing and visible, so please uh, keep that in mind. So I see we've ad adapted the uh, really premier technology in terms of moving <laughs> this process forward.